from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Greg Hanselcheck on preventing and treating lameness in cattle out on pasture. With the summer grazing season commencing, he'll go over the typical causes of that lameness, particularly foot rot infections, saying that rapid treatment is critical to recovery. Then from the Farm Service Agency, Todd Burrows, on the assistance that the USDA makes available to livestock producers whose grazing resources have been compromised by drought. This under the Livestock Forage Program. And on this week's edition of Milk Lines, later on, K-State's Mike Brook will talk about adjusting milking herd numbers in response to the expected rise in milk prices this summer. All that here on Agriculture Today. You're tuned into Agriculture Today. Thanks for being along with us. Every once in a while, our guest stops by to talk matters of bovine health. And joining us is Greg Hanselcheck, Director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit with the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. And Greg, looking not that far ahead as we turn cattle out on pasture for the summertime, watching for and contending with lameness in cattle. It's fairly common, and it's a bigger deal, you say, than some producers might think. It is a bigger deal. I mean, we know it's a major problem on dairies and feedlots, but it is a problem on, in the cow-calf side. And probably the best study that shows that is a 2013 audit where the researchers looked at beef bulls and beef cows that went to slaughter, and they, they lameness scored them. And they found that about 16% of the cows and a third of the bulls that went into the slaughter plants were lame. And so, oh. and these were, like I said, cold beef animals. So a uh, huge issue out there. We don't know the economic effect on the cow-calf side. It's been studied a lot on dairies and, and feedlots. Probably the closest segment that's done some research that we can kind of extrapolate would be the stalker. Some stalker studies showed that uh, calves that were lame uh, actually gained half a pound less during that time period than those calves that weren't lame. So we know that it has effect on the cow-calf side. One of the major concerns are lame bulls, uh, especially in single bull pastures or those kind of situations where if you have a lame bull, the breeding effectiveness or the efficiency of the herd can really go down because of that one bull. They need to be mobile. <laughs> they need to be mobile. Absolutely, they do. Well, where the lameness takes place on the animal. And you say that uh, observations and research tells us it's mostly in the back limbs? Absolutely. So when producers see a lame animal, first thing they need to think of is foot because the numbers are all over the board, but just think 80, 85% of the lameness is in the in the foot. And of that percentage, 70% or more is in the back feet. So if they see somebody noticeably lame, just think foot, back foot first, and then go from there. It really starts there as opposed to somewhere else up the leg, typically. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we can have other, we can have uh, lameness from other things like injuries, like in the hip or the stifle or the hock, but those are rare compared to, to the foot lameness issues. And you say it, it ends up usually being one of two types of lameness, right? Yeah. So in veterinary medicine, we break it out into two categories. One is non-infectious. So those are things like screw toe, uh, horizontal or vertical cracks, laminitis, sole ulcers, corns between the toes, all those kind of things. And then we break it out into the infectious side. Which there's basically two infectious types. One is foot rot and the other is what we call hairy heel warts. One is predominant in cattle herds, the other more so in dairy herds. Absolutely. So hairy heel wart is rare, very rare in pasture beef cows. It is uh, common in dairies, and, it, and it's actually more common as we go through time in feedlots also. But it, mm -hmm. when we talk about infectious lameness in cow-calf herds, especially on pasture, we're talking about foot rot. Yeah. And foot rot is the result of bacteria at work in that hoof. Absolutely. It's a bacterial infection, and there's two major bacteria that work together, but there's a whole bunch of others that, that are there also. But the important thing to remember for producers is the bacteria that are associated with foot rot 
are normal rumen bugs. They're in the rumen, they help digestion, but they're, so they're in the manure, they're in the environment, and those bacteria cannot penetrate the skin. In order to have a, a foot rot infection, something has to break the integrity of the skin to let the bacteria from the outside of the skin to inside or underneath the skin. That could be just about anything, uh, stepping on a rock, for instance. Absolutely. So rocks, let's just talk about that. We've had cases where producers hauled rock around some of their stock tanks to get rid of the, the mud and everything, and it just happened to be the size of the rock and the, the sharpness of the rock when those cows went up to, to drink water. They would actually cut the skin between the toes, and that's that's an important thing about foot rot, too. It's a cut between the toes, and that's where the infection start is in the soft tissue between the toes. And it's evident when it's foot rot. The signs are pretty clear. Well, at the beginning, it's pretty subtle. If you're looking at them a lot, the cows and things, you'll notice that they're lame. But eventually, it'll continue to cause even a more severe lameness. And then eventually, you'll start. they'll start seeing some swelling above the coronary band, that area where the, the hoof is attached to the skin. And that really isn't that big of a deal because even then, if we can get some a treatment into those animals, most of those will recover and do well. The danger is if we don't catch it early and it actually gets above that soft tissue into the tendons, the tendon sheaths, and the joints, now we can have uh, we have an opportunity where they may not respond to our treatment very well, and we could have chronic lame animals. So the key to foot rot management, if we have a case, is recognize lameness early, get the appropriate treatment in them early so that our success rate can be higher. We'll get into treatments in just a second here, but there is one telltale signal that foot rot is present, and that's that pungent odor. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we recommend, we realize it's not always possible, but if there's lameness, pick up the foot. You know, somehow you can get the foot picked up and look to see what's going on. Foot rot, again, there's going to be a cut between the toes. And in Europe, they call it foul foot. F-O-U-L, and that's because it smells bad. And it smells bad because a lot of times there's a piece of dead skin tissue in the crack that the bacteria just love to live on. And so that's that's what it looks like, and that's what it smells like when you pick up a a foot rot foot. And once again, before we talk treatment, exposure to wet conditions can also aggravate this situation. And you say that can come back to something as... Basic is cattle standing in ponds in Absolutely. the summer. Absolutely. So we, the talk, heat. we talked about the rocks and then uh, any wet, constant wet conditions, whether it's a wet spring where they're in the mud or in the summertime when it's hot and they're standing in the pond or at the edge of the pond, their feet are constantly wet. That's going to break the integrity of the skin and make it less of a barrier. So it, it's really those, those three things, either too wet and then we can have too dry where we just have cracked skin or we can have some type of mechanical injury that's going to start a foot rot. Well, as a cow-calf producer or a stalker, calf manager might be preparing for the prospect of foot rot. What treatment options should they be looking at now and and planning to implement? Well, there's several products that are on the market that are effective. Uh, As we always do on this program, we recommend they work with their veterinarian to, to pick the appropriate one. And again, the key is early, early treatment. And even though darts are, are kind of a, a thing that are not promoted, there are there are operations where that's the only way that you're actually going to be able to treat these animals. And, and just as a reminder that most of the darts, the amount of antibiotic in those darts is not enough to actually provide a, an effective treatment. So, mm. again, go through your veterinarian and, and try to decide what the best treatment is for, for those animals. That, uh, the primary approaches would be an injectable. Antibiotic it's, or a topical, you say? Yep. So that's typically, if we're not going to pick up the foot and we're just going to treat, then we're going to just use an injectable, however we can do that. If we pick up the foot, which, again, we strongly recommend, then what we're going to do is clean out that crack, get rid of that dead tissue, because, again, the bacteria love to live there, and then we'll put a topical antibiotic, and then probably put a, most veterinarians will put a wrap on there to keep the, the crack kind of covered, and then probably use an injectable also. Well, these are all responses to the condition, which often producers cannot uh, keep from happening initially. 
But are there things that can be done to prevent the prospect of foot rot or other kinds of lameness? There are some things. And like you said, a lot of this foot rot is caused by environmental conditions that producers have no control over. But trace minerals are so very, very important to skin health, especially zinc, that it's important that the producers have a really good trace mineral uh, available to their cows with the proper amount of zinc, selenium, uh, copper, and iodine. And those are the four trace minerals that are extremely important. And make sure that the mineral's out there at all times, and then make sure that the, the consumption, which is typically two to four ounces per head per day, that the, those cows are eating it. That's one thing that they can do to help prevent it. And then there are some vaccines on the market, yeah. injectable, killed vaccines, and the effectiveness from real world is is pretty iffy on whether they're all that effective but for sometimes herds that are in an environmental condition every year where the cows are predisposed to a foot rot that may be a time or a place where a vaccine would be could be used and especially if you think about if you just protect the bulls from becoming lame it's going to be beneficial from the reproductive side big time if you go that route once again Consultation with your practitioner is imperative here. Absolutely. Consultation with the veterinarian and, and also think about the timing. of These vaccines, uh, it's not something that you're going to give in November and then expect to have coverage when you go to pasture in, in May or June of the next year. So timing of the vaccine is important also. All of this is very important in as far as avoiding lameness problems in cattle, cow calf herds, stalkers as they're out on grass this summer. Take these precautions and these necessary steps to respond if that is required. Greg, we always appreciate the word. Thanks for coming over once again. You bet. He is Greg Hanselcheck. He's from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. He's along regularly to talk bovine health management with us here on Agriculture Today. We're back now on Agriculture Today. More for you from your Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas. Across the way now is the Farm Program Chief with the Kansas FSA, based in Manhattan, Todd Barrows. Todd, we're going to pick up on a recurring theme, unfortunately, in the state. Our rains, the last few days notwithstanding, we're still stuck in drought in many parts of Kansas. And there are programs out there from the USDA available to assist producers through these conditions. We want to speak to that today. Yeah, absolutely, Eric. And it is a little ironic that as we're talking about these livestock forage program and drought programs for livestock producers that graze these forages that it is raining outside but uh unfortunately yeah we are in that drought situation so livestock forage program is for livestock owners or contract growers who are also producers of grazed forage crops that suffer a grazing loss because of a qualifying drought and that's the key it has to be a qualifying drought the loss must have occurred during the normal grazing period for that area or for that pasture type in the county on land that is native or improved pasture lands or or with permanent vegetative cover, or it could be planted to a crop that is specifically for grazing for covered livestock, and that may be an improved grass or a forage sorghum. Mm -hmm. Currently today, Eric, there's 64 counties in Kansas that qualify for some type of LFP grazing land at this point. How counties become eligible? That might be worth a review here, Todd. Yeah, that's a good question. Just for producers to re-familiarize themselves, and they can look this up on their own, because we follow the U.S. Drought Monitor in becoming eligible for these uh, livestock grazing programs. And the key issue, though, is that drought severity index has to be uh, not only in the physically located area or county that you're grazing, but also has to be in that normal grazing period established by the Kansas FSA State Committee. There's different levels to that drought intensity rating. Uh, It starts out with a D2 severe drought intensity, and for that one, it has to be at least eight consecutive weeks during the normal grazing period before it kicks in. And then it goes up through a D3 and a D4, which is an exceptional drought intensity any time during that normal grazing period. 
And depending on the drought severity or intensity factor with U.S. Drought Monitor, then that determines the number of months that a producer could potentially receive some benefit. Those are the qualifiers for a county being eligible and therefore producers operating a grazing program within that county to be eligible. As far as benefits accrued to the participant, then how are those determined? Those payments are they're based on livestock groups and then, of course, eligible livestock grazing acres factor into it as well. But a producer can receive payments for uh, one, three, four, or five times the monthly payment rate based on the drought intensity and the length of the drought. So that monthly payment rate is equal to 60% of the lesser monthly feed costs for all covered livestock or calculated using the normal carrying capacity of the grazing land. And for 2022 program year, that monthly feed cost rate is $47.29 per month per head, and the daily animal unit feed rate is around $1.06 per animal unit based on the normal carrying capacity. And I want to point out that that's a national payment. So no matter where you're at, not only within the state of Kansas, but anywhere in the nation, it's all computed based on that same dollar value. So those are standardized, those levels of support here. When we talk livestock, are we talking all manner of livestock species eligible here? So when we talk about eligible livestock for the LFP, since it is a forage grazing program, obviously it has to be a grazing animal, such as an adult or non-adult uh, beef animal. could be a, a beefalo or a buffalo or bison. You know, if you have dairy cattle that are actually turned out grazing those acres and they're eligible, and then you have uh, some other ones that you might not think quite as much in Kansas about, but they're definitely eligible, and that's your goats and your sheep and your alpacas, and even uh, we have a, a several deer farmers and stuff that could be eligible as well. Horses fall into that bucket yep. too. Yeah, equine would fall into that as as long as they're used for a commercial basis and not used for recreational purposes. But livestock that don't normally graze then would not be eligible. That's right. Then the other eligible livestock are the thing to think about of being eligible livestock are those that would normally be in grazing land or pasture land during the normal grazing period if you wouldn't have that qualifying drought. So livestock that would not have normally been grazing will not be eligible. However, if the livestock would normally have been grazing, but the producer had to move those livestock to another county for grazing, the livestock would still be eligible. And then livestock had to be owned, leased, purchased, or entered into a contract to purchase uh, during the 60 days prior to the beginning day of the drought. So you had to own them at within that 60 days prior to the drought going into place in order to be eligible for the program. They cannot be livestock that would normally be in a feedlot or be for consumption by the owner or a contract grower. Uh, and they cannot be uh, free roaming animals or animals that would be used for recreational purposes such as pleasure riding, roping, hunting, and that's where we get into the equine, right. and that gets to be a fine line or a show animal. And then finally, I want to point out that unweaned livestock or non-adult uh, calf on the side of that adult beef animal or cow, those are also not eligible for the LFP because we're paying for the cow. Those are the parameters of the program, but producers would need to initially find out if their county is eligible for LFP support, and uh, a stopover at that local FSA office will take Absolute, care of that? Absolutely, Eric. Uh, we get an updated listing from the National Office for Eligible Counties based on the el different grazing types. That comes out every Thursday with the, when the drought monitor comes out. Uh, that local FSA service center can tell you of the different availability of the different grazing lands in their, in that Pacific County. Well, that's the outline on the USDA's Livestock Forage Program, providing assistance to producers who are dealing with strain on their grazing programs because of drought conditions. There's another program that you wanted to briefly mention as well, and it's in place and available in certain parts of Kansas which have contended with wildfire, and there's been way too much of that, of course, Todd. But tell us about the Emergency Assistance for Livestock Program here. Yeah, I just wanted to bring this up again, and, and unfortunately, 
some producers and areas have got way too familiar with this program in the last four to five, six months. But we do have the Emergency Assistance for Livestock program, and that is the program that covers disaster loss due to wildfires. Again, for grazing, pasture loss, and the wildfire had to happen during the normal grazing season, and that has caught some of our producers when those wildfires happen outside that normal grazing period. But also, it does provide eligibility for other producers in other parts of the state. So I just wanted to mention that. And along with that, if you had any mechanically harvested feed losses or purchased feed losses due to wildfires, there's also some assistance to cover that under the uh, ELAP program or Emergency Assistance Livestock Program. The other couple programs are a little bit lesser known, and they still fall under that Emergency Livestock Assistance Program umbrella, and that is water transportation and livestock feed transportation. And these aren't quite as well known, but since we're talking about they are drought-driven programs, and if your county is eligible for the LFP program, Most likely, you could be eligible for the water transportation and livestock feed transportation programs. Uh, Water transportation provides assistance for hauling water to eligible livestock on those grazing lands during the normal grazing period due to drought that would not normally require that water to be transported. And then the other one, or the last one I want to bring up, is livestock feed transportation. It is for the help pay for the cost of transporting feed to eligible livestock uh, when producers have had to go outside their normal trade of business area to find quality feed to uh, purchase to feed their their herds to keep them going uh, we will pay for assistance on that transportation cost so it has to be for mileage above normal the minimum is 25 miles, not to see 1,000 miles, and that's per truckload. And so the producers would have to provide documentation for, for that purchase of that feed, and then, and then we can work with them on providing some assistance there as well. Very well. Well, there are, as can be heard, multiple forms of relief for producers who have had to figure out how to work through the droughty conditions with their grazing programs, as well as that assistance for those who have dealt with wildfire and trying to get back on their feet with their livestock management. The Livestock Forage Program, Emergency Assistance for Livestock Program, likewise, all questions about either or both can be answered at your local FSA counter. As always, Todd, and thank you for coming over today. Thanks, Eric. Todd Barrows, Farm Program Chief with the FSA State Headquarters here in Kansas. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues now with this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Research and Extension Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike. Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy producers about summertime milk production on your herd. You know, it looks like uh, we're going to be blessed with some really favorable milk prices this summer. So for you to take advantage of it, you need to ship probably every pound of milk you can this summer. So a couple of things I'd like you to maybe do before you head to the field, maybe even to start planting corn if you haven't already started ready. Take a look at your herd. Do you have animals that probably really need to just go? You know, if they're dragging on production and if they're not pregnant and they're more than, say, 200 days in milk, probably that's an animal that needs to come out of the herd. However, what are you going to replace her with? Do you have another heifer to take that place? Or do you need to consider going out and buying a few animals? You know, even if you're a small herd, you know, 100 cows, Adding another 5 to 10 cows to the herd over summer to increase summertime milk flow could have a significant impact on your overall checking account. So, what do you need to think about? Well, number one, you have to have room. If you're going to add cows, you have to have room. You have to have the ability to milk those cows. You have to have the ability to feed those cows. So, taking a close inventory of what you have for labor for the summer is 
well as uh, feed inventory, how you're going to feed a few extra miles around the table would be important things to consider before you jump. I think in most cases, we've probably got the space in the barn. That's not a question. But make sure that you have plenty of space in the barn for those animals to adequately rest as well as to feed. So again, maybe you're not interested in spending a lot of of additional time in the milking parlor this summer. However, spending a few minutes to milk a few extra cows each milking may really increase your cash flow on the farm. And this might be one of the summers to try to take advantage of this. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to take inventory of the animals they'll be milking this summer and thinking about maybe adding a few animals if necessary to keep milk flow high during the summer months. Thanks, Mike. And in our remaining time today, a quick calendar item for you. K-State Research and Extension will be teaming up with the Kansas NRCS and the Soil Health Nexus to host a soil health workshop later this month, specifically Wednesday and Thursday, May the 18th and the 19th at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes. This is a two-day workshop. And those of you participating will learn about soil health principles, soil management, and carbon credits. K-State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson is one of those organizing this. Anywhere you've lived in the state of Kansas this year, specifically, we've dealt with wind erosion. So we're not only going to talk about the benefits of soil health, we're also going to have some experience with showing what wind erosion can happen. If we have some type of cover on the ground, We're going to look at water infiltration. We're going to try and understand what soil testing and what the soil test results look at so that we're all kind of on the same page. We're looking at it. We're understanding it. We're going to have soil pits. We're going to look at that in a tillage system versus a no-till system. So the biggest take-home is it doesn't matter where you live in the state or maybe you're from an adjoining state, Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma, Missouri. The soil health principles apply regardless of where you live. K-State's Stacy Minson there. There is no fee to take part in this. All the meals are sponsored on-site. They're asking you to RSVP for this workshop no later than May the 15th. You can do so by contacting the Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, or you can contact Stacy directly. Her contact information is at the Kansas Center for Agricultural Resources and the Environment website. A soil health workshop. The venue is K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, and the dates are Wednesday and Thursday, May the 18th and the 19th. And with that, our time's away today. Thank you for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.